Hello, everyone. Since this is either a highlight, a standalone book, or the first episode in a series, I'm jumping in to remind you what the rules are for this podcast. First rule is no real people stories. That means that any details from our own lives are merely anecdotal. We do not read books about real people, and we are not reading historical fiction. The second rule is that we are basing our analyses off of how the author treats characters and what they put them through. We are not judging the accuracy of the trauma, the accuracy of any actual conditions that may be portrayed, nor the authenticity of a character's reaction to that trauma or that particular condition. This podcast is for entertainment purposes only. The hosts are not trained professionals, and their opinions come solely from personal experience. In this episode, we discuss fictional depictions of trauma and violence that may not be suitable for all audiences. Please take care of yourselves. Specific content warnings for each episode can be found in the show notes. Events in the media are discussed in approximate order of escalation. This episode contains spoilers. And I'm Robin, and on this episode of Books That Burn, we are discussing A Strange and Stubborn Endurance by Foz Meadows. The, for the description of this book from the publisher, we have, uh, begins with a quote from the book, Stolen me, as soon to say a caged bird can be stolen by the sky. Velison Vin Aro never planned to marry at all, let alone a girl from neighboring Tithania. When an ugly confrontation reveals his preference for men, Vel fears he's ruined the diplomatic union before it can even begin. But while his family is ready to disown him, the Tithani envoy has a different solution, for Vel to marry his former intended's brother instead. Cathari Eduria always knew he might end up in a political marriage, but his sudden betrothal to a man from Ralia, where such relationships are forbidden, comes as a shock. With an unknown faction willing to kill to end their new alliance, Vel and Kay have no choice but to trust each other. Survival is one thing, but love, as both will learn, is quite another. Yeah, I I love I love this book so much. Uh so I so I had already read it a month before the record, and so it was like, oh, like it. I read this last month. We're about to record the episode. I don't need to reread it again. And the night before, I was like, okay, so actually, I'm going to reread it again because it's great, <laughs> and I really love this book. Uh, so that's that's where I am with this. Uh, I don't know if you had any uh, pre-topic thoughts before we get into our first topic. That's mine. Oh. Uh-huh. Nah. I mean, pre-topic thoughts aren't a usual thing. No. I just really, <laughs> really love this book. Okay, so for our first topic, and we're just doing two topics this time because um, we found two topics that are big enough and complicated enough that we want them to have enough space and not try to fit a third topic in. And the first of those two is social isolation. With um, some uh, interesting flavors of ableism and classism playing into it, but we're focusing on the social isolation aspect of it for Markle, who is Velison's uh, friend. Like, exactly what words to use to describe themselves to each other end up being shaped a lot by class, but over the course of the book, over and over it's like no, like this is this is his best friend. Um yeah. I don't know if you wanted to briefly intro this if you'd like me to. I'm good with whichever. Uh I can intro it. So okay. um our character is mute but able to hear. Yes. And mute but not deaf. Mute but not deaf. 
and also sp- speaks two languages at least mm-hmm. three technically if you count the sign language uh yeah not actually sure if that one is fluency i would generally say to- that that I would generally say that, like, that is knowing a third language. Well, like, uh, yeah. And no, it, it is. I was just yeah. trying to determine in my head um, if they are fluent in it or if, if they have enough signs to sign with the one person they talk to. Um, and I don't actually know if we have, like, concrete specific evidence for that. Given um, the yeah, number of speak- times that they have lengthy conversations with each other all in sign, I would venture okay. to say that at this point in their lives, both, both Markle and okay. Bellison are fluent in in the form of sign language that they use. Okay. So, yeah. So, speaks three languages or understands two and speaks one or speaks I mean, three, he whatever. he, I think, um, writes two and speaks one, potentially. Does he write in both? That understands. I, I tell. I don't know the 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 um. But anyways, m- multi yes. uh, mul- bi- uh multilingual multilingual um, yeah. and um, but has a a pretty reoccurring issue where uh people don't either bother to take the time to communicate with them or uh Velasen and um. I'm blanking on names Kathari. today, Jesus. Kathari. You can call them K and Val. That's not better. <laughs> okay. Uh, Velasen and Kathari um, deliberately encourage the perception that Kathari is unable to understand. That Markle is unable to. Markle. What? Who, where did Kathari Val and come K from? Val are the couple. Sorry. Oh, you're pronouncing that way different than I was. I'm pronouncing it like the audiobook. I, I have no experience with that. <laughs> uh, Markle is unable to understand spoken language. So sometimes this is an isolating thing just because of either ableist or classist or just not considerate people in their vicinity. And sometimes this is a deliberate ruse. Um, but uh, because of those various factors, um, Markle's pretty isolated, pretty unable to communicate, generally speaking, especially in the country where the two of them grew up. And they, uh, so he has the one friend <laughs> in, in Velasen who is also his liege, basically, his employer. And we, we kind of get to the start of the book and it's passed off of just like the way that it is. It's kind of an assumption that, you know, that people aren't going to take the time or that there will be specific reasons to deliberately deceive people in their lives just for information's sake and you know potential political safety and things like that but once they move to the country where k is from um suddenly people bother to kind of take an interest in markle and make sure that they're comfortable and make sure that they're heard and understood And it changes the character, (laughs) changes their, like, just on-screen outgoingness and allows them to, you know, ask for particular things that they want without feeling like they're blowing their cover. Um, We we just see this very profound change in how the character portrays themselves in front of other people. And I think the way I might, the way that it's characterized um, was that in Ralia, people assumed that because he was a servant, he was he couldn't have anything worthwhile to say. And then additionally, right. because he was mute, they assumed that that meant he couldn't hear or is unintelligent. And so when that's the baseline, Markle and right. Bellison didn't correct those people right. on the fact that actually he could understand. And so that's the context in which previously they didn't let on that he understood a lot more than people assumed. Um, and then also even in Tithania, they um, like they note which grooms like 
ignore him and treat him like he's not gonna right. or which like people ignore him and treat him like he's not gonna be able to understand but people who um for those who are approaching him um without that and um trying to work around the language barrier that they assume exists but still trying to talk to him right for for those people he then says actually i i I do know your language and yes i will teach you signs and and initially uh (laughs) he deliberately offers to communicate and teach uh Mm -hmm. the the sign language to k but then messes up in front of somebody that wasn't supposed to know that he spoke the other language the current native language where they were Mm -hmm. Uh, oh that was something else too is that in this in this new place for the two of them yeah yeah they are they're putting up a ruse that he can speak or can understand uh their native language but not the language of the current culture Uh and he he messes up he accidentally lets on that he knows what is being said when he's had intentionally been not point not letting people have this knowledge Uh um and it's such a funny moment in the character scene because both uh val and and um i can't do names today what is his name again val and k k or mark no markle is the guy markle is the guy Um, with mutism both both um val and markle are like wait wait no hold on oops uh (laughs) uh-oh that wasn't the intentional that wasn't the plan we didn't want to do that and then they kind of go okay actually no you know what never mind that's fine this is a this feels better and safer and it's probably okay that that you know um but there's there's this moment of slight panic on screen which is kind of amusing um as both characters kind of realize that you know the the <laughs> the ruse is up yeah. and that that's not typical this is not something that either of the two of them normally slips on yeah like, but also, like, part of why they slip is because he's really, really comfortable with this other person. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's comfortable and safe, and so it's fine. Yeah. Like, it ends up genuinely actually being fine. Um, Which also made this one, like, an interesting topic to discuss because, like, a, a lot of what is like a genuine worry for them in the book ends up working out a lot better than they thought it would. And with Markle in particular, having a lot more control about his access to communication. And um, like, he says, you know, like, I'll, I'll teach you, I'll teach K signs and, you know, I'll teach anyone who wants to learn it because Mm -hmm. I think implicit in that is that he has this opportunity in this place that doesn't have the same kinds of class barriers that had constrained him before. There's an opportunity to also remove, um, to to not hide behind some of the ableist assumptions because like even if he'd fought the ableism in Ralia, the classism would still have been like just as much as a barrier and so now in the space with not necessarily less classism but right different and in a way that <laughs> seems more conducive to flourishing um like there's class, but there isn't as much classism. Um, well, well, and also, not, or not at least in the same kind of constraining way. And so there's mm-hmm. there's more space for him to explore this. Not that this other society is by any means perfect. Like it doesn't it doesn't do that at all. <laughs> no, the, the, no, it's, it's just, just different. The, their problems are different, and their problems are easier for him personally to navigate. Well, um, and and also. Um, uh th- there's also kind of this acknowledgement i think too so uh part of the reason that markle doesn't really i guess try to fight fight it back in there when they were growing up is that a lot of it is is keeping communication between himself and val secret and so to keep both of them safe 
because they can talk about things that are taboo or grounds for, you know, banishment and social degradation and, and, and other things, um, without worry that, you know, somebody will understand or somebody will, will eavesdrop. And there's kind of this, I guess, implicit acknowledgement that it's okay because these particular things, specifically homophobia, but, Mm -hmm. you know, other dangers that were true and, and, and there is very real threats to Val back home are not an issue here. And so if somebody eavesdrops, well, it's not going to result in somebody being either killed or kicked out of home and, you know, left to starve. Like, that's just not going to happen. That threat isn't there anymore. Right. Because also they're in this context in Ralia where in order to have secret communications, the nobles have taken up speaking a different country's language as a fashion. (laughs) And so I think implicit is Markle not wanting his signs to be the latest fashion that a bunch of hearing people are using. Oh yeah. And then still not talking to him because of class stuff. Like they learned it from a book and a fisherman. Um, Like they, they learned it from like this written resource. And then I think to me, what seemed implicitly like, if I had, like, we don't know that this fisherman was a member of the deaf community yeah. or whatever the equivalent was in this world, but it definitely wasn't a noble, um, <laughs> specifically. And so, like, getting around that class barrier, like, I, I don't, I think it would have been really, really terrible if their, their hand signs had become the latest fad language for right. the nobles to take up. Like, that right. would have been really bad, but Tithania doesn't. Have. doesn't really do that <laughs> doesn't yeah. have that attitude toward other people yeah it doesn't have that yeah. like already ongoing thing well and and also i think to that point the implication and explicit reasoning given when somebody inquires about learning this is either i want to communicate with you Or I have a practical application reason that this would be a helpful thing to know and not, as you're saying, because it's the latest fashion. Um, I think the only example of that's not just I want to communicate with you personally and so I want to learn this that we see in the book is when one of the military officers comes up and says, hey, that would be really useful in situations where soldiers can't talk, huh? (laughs) Any, Any chance that I could, you know, also learn this just for other people's safety and like... As a, but again, as a tool to use and not as a, as a fun thing to be, uh, make yourself seem interesting. Right. Uh, anything else? I don't think that. I think that's mainly what I had for this one. I'm very excited for our next topic. <laughs> On to our second, and in this case, final topic, because we're just doing two, intimate partner violence. Now, what I want to say very specifically is this is not violence in between the two main love interests. Like, it's not. I would just like to categorically, in a non-spoiler way, (laughs) just say that is not what we're talking about. Um, But there is an assault from Vel's ex. Um, who has been his ex for like a day when the assault happens. And so I'm like, okay, nope. I part of what's going on is this person breaking boundaries, but also there had been this previous context of a relationship. Um, so just broadly speaking, put this under intimate partner violence. Cause there's also some, some things that Velison is afraid might happen but don't that also fall into this umbrella. And so we're just wrapping it up all under this label. Um, so one of the things that's going on, we've mentioned like that there's these two countries and that Val came from Relia to Tithania and he be coming from a homophobic and seems like implicitly misogynist, at least among the nobility, this homophobic and misogynist environment where women 
especially so specifically noble women are married off to secure alliances um there's kind of a de facto expectation that marital rape just will happen and isn't a problem um and is in fact it expected when right your couple is cishet that they're that one that all the couples will be cishet and that and that they're the marriage doesn't count unless it's consummated um and just this this whole pile of things that add up to um women being um feeling either either literally or just whether or not any individual woman feels sold off to the highest bidder that culturally the expectation is that even if that is what happens it is cool fine and good and there's nothing bad to see here please move on folks um so not not even that just it's so normal that even saying nothing to see here would be suspicious and weird. <laughs> right, right. And so Velison, as a gay man marrying a man, he, he, there's a there's a lot of moments where the the only way that he knows to think of himself is as a Raleighan bride because right. A Raleighan man would not marry a man, and so he doesn't know he doesn't know how to conceptualize himself, but also deeply unfortunately, that ends up meaning that he thinks, oh, just like a Raleighan bride, my new partner is going to rape me and not see that it's a problem. Mm-hmm. Um exactly control the fact- me, financially control me, et cetera, et cetera. Right. That anything that he does would be on this new partner's sufferance. Um, that he would be allowed to do things, best case scenario, encouraged to have a hobby, um, but that he would be expected <laughs> to perform sexually on the other person's timetable. Um, oh, I do and- want to point out also, like, mm-hmm. this is not just um, coming from him just assuming that he'll have this place in their partnership and not you know say that his husband would be in that wife role and be subservient he specifically puts himself in this position because one aftermath from the rape but also two the it starts out when his dad is saying hey you're gonna you know be married off to this place in this foreign country um Starts, you know, he st- the starts the conversation and Val assumes um, you're going to, you know, we're doing this because you increased my allowance, question mark. And so I can afford to support a wife. And his dad goes, oh, no, your wife is going to support you because That's I don't point. have the money. And so even when there was an implication of it being a, a cishet marriage, he was already being being put in a subservient position because they didn't have the money. <laughs> Right, and, and so then when in, it changed to be a a gay marriage, he was stuck mentally in the oh no, <laughs> you know am, now my spouse has all the power. I am the partner who brings a political tie, but very very little money right. to this arrangement, and so he's seeing himself in. Also, like he's the one who had to move to the other person's yes. country, so like there's a whole lot there's of so reasons. Many- places where the mm-hmm. power dynamic is not in his favor and he's fully aware of it. Right. And because those uneven power dynamics in his own country are so tied up with sexual mm-hmm. identity, mm-hmm. he doesn't know how to conceptualize himself except in this way that has all sorts of really really unfortunate implications. And so because um in in like I think it's the second chapter of the book. He is um, assaulted and raped by the per- by someone he broke up with, like the yeah. day before the book began. Like yeah. he's literally fleeing the house that he was in because he Flee- broke up with this his person. Parents fl- or his dad fleeing yeah. that ex, fleeing this the culture that. Yeah, you know, it's pressing. Like, there's yeah, 
But even then, like, I'm saying even before it turns out that he's fleeing his dad, before that, True, yeah. he's, he's, he's fleeing this ex, and the ex follows him and then assaults him. Yeah. And um, that ends up getting witnessed by people who don't want in one case doesn't realize it as an is it's an assault and in the other Couple case cases, even if I he'd think. realized well even the, and then the case of his father even if he had realized it was an assault he wouldn't care because his main concern would be this was a gay thing and that's gross um right and so he he sent away with people not realizing that the thing that clued him in that he preferred men one it could have been totally possible for it to not be a preference. Luckily, they did, like, actually check that. They're like, you know, <laughs> hey, do you like women? And it was like, no, I, I just like men. Like, he did get asked yeah. that. Um, but because of that, like, he had just been assaulted by a partner and then is handed off to a new partner he's never met. And with all this stuff, he assumes that he's going to get assaulted. And... One of the things that I like about this book and this particular portrayal of this dynamic is that through this experience, he ends up, while processing his own situation, having a lot of empathy he hadn't previously had the context to realize yeah. for women back in his own country. Um I liked that. Well, and and then there's I... there's implications that he was kind of working through that particular thing even before mm-hmm. this happened. For sure. Um, but he still has lapses where he goes, oh, whoop, oh yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> You and put a also, woman in that role? Oh, yeah, okay. I, I, could, I have the background to process this. I just have to get there. Yeah. Like, he keeps being surprised that there's women in these positions of power, not because he doesn't think they should be there, but because he implicitly kind of still has the assumption that the society wouldn't let them get there. But surprised for 10 seconds and not, like, three days. Right, right. Um, And one of the other things that I like about how this is, is handled is that once the... Um, once his Tithanian partner realizes that this is the misunderstanding that happens, he takes steps to address on a systemic level as much as he can um, to try and make sure that this misunderstanding between these two countries doesn't happen again, regardless of the genders of the pairings that they're, that no one else, because like there might be women who marry to Raleigh and women who marry to Thanian men and are concerned that this is going to happen to them or like regardless of the genders involved um they want to make sure that people who are inter that Tithanians who are interfacing diplomatically with Ralia and negotiating these contracts make sure that this misunderstanding never happens again yeah. because it could be deadly and it almost was deadly um, because of how much Vellison uh, did not want to have that happen to him again, or or even could lead could be potentially deadly if a if their spousal abuser, right? Because also even if like the envoy makes it super clear that this isn't okay, and then it turns out there was <laughs> a Tithanian partner who did do something, like having right. set the expectation that like hey, like, in this country, this isn't okay. You can go to somebody. You can say something. Um, Like, I mean, obviously, the book doesn't go into quite this detail. Um, Well, I mean, the book does address, like, um, divorce is the highest of scandal in one place and just kind of fine in the other. Like, there's some implications there where, you know, in in the one country, you, you have no options. And if you mm-hmm. are if you are the woman in the pairing, you are you're stuck, and that's it. And you know you only divorce if it's a if you're allowed to. Yeah. But in the other, no. If your husband's mistreating you, you can just walk. <laughs> if your and wife you is can... mistreating you, you can just leave, and you don't even you can have you have a no fault divorce basically, or you can you can in court blame them for mm-hmm. doing something that was not okay. Yeah, and if if a chem who's your partner, like same thing, just you know, yeah. gender and discriminate in that. Yeah. 
um chem is their um non-binary their, yeah their third gender term um yeah it seems to equate pretty closely to non-binary um yeah it um i just there's so many things i really like about how this is handled um i think um one more that we should put we should put out there too that's not a well i mean maybe it's cultural but specifically in this relationship Mm -hmm. um they they have this so our our main character who was the one who was assaulted um is the person driving his own context and boundaries for his own reactions um Mm -hmm. now to be fair he's a nobleman (laughs) and so there is a lot of like uh he's just irritated today and kind of mean um which is kind of excused in a way that you know it kind of seems like us servants are like oh yeah okay they are gonna be like this sometimes um especially if you're from if you're a rally and nobleman um Mm -hmm. but from his partner from his husband um it's it's not taken as once his husband knows what is going on it's not taken as oh you're being mean to me it's taken as hey i have figured out already that this is an emotional reaction to something and now i know what that something is and so when i see you like this i check in and see what you need um and you can see more and more in the book um he's actively intentionally checking in with Val. Yeah. And not just, Hey, do you need a hug? But what do you need right now? Do you Mm -hmm. need sleep or food or me to hold your hand? Like you need something and I can tell you're not all right. What is it? Or need me to not hold your hand. Exactly. It's the case several times. Yeah. Cause, um, but that, but this is actually a really good book, a really good guide for how to treat someone who has gone through a traumatic event. <laughs> like, um, and it do- doesn't have to be an, an emotional or sexual partner, but just the the level of attention to detail on their boundaries. Even like this, like Val is hurt a lot of the beginning of this book. Mm-hmm. Is hurt in the leg. He can't really walk on his own for like a good. 24 hours um and the whole events of this book minus like two weeks of travel that is just kind of implied um really kind of takes place in less than a week i think it actually is a week once they arrive in tithania because there's the marriage and then the gathering that is generally a week later um right which is the final day yeah so this whole book takes place in less than a month and we only get about a week of it on screen and for us at least a day of that our our one of our two main pov characters is injured and can't walk but also doesn't want anyone to touch them yep (laughs) and you know you see people who are kind of like hey if we're going to move you from this place to this other place the best way to do that is for me to just like support you and have you walk on one leg that's currently our our best option is that okay? And our and you, the character has the space to tell them no, and sometimes does, and then sometimes says yes, okay, that's fine. But then let go immediately as soon as I have somewhere else to sit. And and also um, on the the topic of having a, a character who finds themselves rather suddenly the partner of someone who has just been through this very traumatic experience, they also. Um, Kay also has to navigate getting Vel what he needs without breaking his confidence, um, which ends up being yeah. like without telling people who it is none of their business, um, yeah. what's happening, but also taking what measures are are needed to get, um, to get Vel the help that he needs. And the um, the resolution that he needs as it relates to his abuser, 
Because there's like a, do you want to go through the courts? There's this version of the courts. There's that version of the courts. And, you know, what what would you like us to do? What solution right. would be the closure that you need? And then he listens to him and they do that as much as is possible. Um, yeah, I also like how like at its heart, this is a murder mystery. <laughs> it's a very good murder mystery. <laughs> it's a really cool murder mystery. It's almost a pre-murder mystery. A little bit. It's a someone keeps trying to stab people and we really uh, need <laughs> we to really find out who them. it is. Yeah. We need to find out who it is so that they can't keep doing that. Um Yeah, and I it it makes for this like interesting blend of like a really specific problem that they have to solve right now but can't delay but also these complications from this other stuff that doesn't necessarily have a specific solution, but does need to be mitigated on an ongoing basis. And just navigating that space, I think, is handled. It's really well. Um, it's yeah. handled really well. Yep. So... I have a question. Have you ever wanted to get into comics, but you just didn't know where to start? Well, welcome to Comics Quest. I'm JD Martin, and every week I sit down with a guest to talk a comic that I think anybody can pick up and start their comics reading journey. We take a look at psychedelic sci-fi, fantastical action, heart-wrenching love stories, and of course, superheroes. So check us out at certainpov.com or wherever you listen to your podcasts. On to the wrap-up and ratings for A Strange and Stubborn Endurance by Foz Meadows. For our gratuity rating for social isolation, is this mild, moderate, severe, or I guess backstory. Some of it's backstory. Some of it's back- I, think I think it's moderate because some of it is intentional and consensual. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. Um, I, feel, I feel good about moderate for that. All right. Um, partner violence. Severe. Um, it is severe. I would like to note it is explicitly not torture porn. Yeah. Explicitly like, labeled as bad. Very specifically severe, but not meant to be enjoyed by the reader. Then trauma, integral, interchangeable, or irrelevant for social isolation. If we take um, that away, how much of the book is left? I, I think it's interchangeable. Okay. Um, because a large part of the social isolation is people not willing to, or not knowing to, one of the two, either being unwilling or not knowing it's an option to slow down and just let the character write out a response. Um, right. And you could have taken that away and had them be not socially isolated and still kept the sign language as a pretty, like, exclusive thing. Like, mm-hmm. it did not have to be both. Like, maybe, you know, they they carry. Maybe, they they canonically already all carry the time. a notepad. They canonically already do oh, that. Oh, that's true. And they just yeah. don't use it when they don't want people to know they're listening. Um, yeah. So I, I think that's totally interchangeable. Okay. No, that, that makes sense. Um, so the intimate partner violence. That is, I think that's integral to the plot. Yeah. Like, it is, you can't, I don't, I think you have a fundamentally different story. Yes. Um, Agreed. If that's removed. Because um, also the way that that's addressed winds in just with a whole bunch of other things in the plot. Characters' motivations literally don't make sense without this information. Yeah. And the fact that yeah. they don't make sense without this information is addressed in the actual book. Yes. Um <laughs> so, it's yeah, mystery. This, do, yes, do, 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 this do, is do, definitely do, do, do. <laughs> Yeah, this fun fun mystery book. <laughs> um uh, Yeah, definitely uh, integral. Okay. I think was this may this... also be the longest title for a book we've had. Oh, don't worry. I can find a longer title if you want one. But yes, I think thus so far, so we've recorded, this is one of the longer ones. We've recorded two books today. And our first book had, I think, the longest list of trigger warnings that we've had so far in one recording. And this one, I think, has the longest title for a book that we've had so far in a recording. Um. 
potentially. It's possible that I'm forgetting one. But this is five words long. <laughs> um, anyways, sorry. Integral, interchangeable, irrelevant. Or is, no, no, no. We already did that, that, that one. Treated with care. Uh, yes. Enough. Not enough. No. Um, I think that, yeah, for the social isolation, I think it is. I think it's either enough or yes, because again, it's consensual, yeah. it's deliberate on some parts. But a, a lot of the stuff is backstory for some of the worst bits. Yeah, yeah. I think I'd go ahead and say, since we're not sure, I think it should put I, I enough. Mean, I think it's just yes you think it's yes i think it's just yes i think the only reason it would just not be a yes is if somebody identifies so strongly with that isolation and is and even though it's it's intentional on the part of the character being isolated that's still not enough but that's so specific that i don't think we can chalk that up to the book i think that's a personal thing so i think it's just yes okay I'm I'm good with that. All right. Then for the intimate partner violence, mm, I think enough. Yeah, I think enough. <laughs> um cuz also um the character doesn't so- even realize it's happening in the moment and it's almost an and an, a retrospective, oh no, this is what's happened to me. And um, then there's so much intentional so, care by the other characters in treatment of this character later so here's where i think we need to like pull back the curtain uh, slightly and say that you skipped reading the sex scenes because that's your preference i did read and... the first rape scene i did read that oh you you did actually read that i did scene. actually okay read that. all right i skipped I, the I consensual sure. three page sex scene later yeah 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 okay all right um but you'd, you'd said that it, you'd refer to them both as, like, skippable without losing too much of the narrative. So that had left... Uh, oh, the, the first one is, I just didn't skip it because it was so You short. didn't skip it. Okay. All right, then. But yeah, so... Um, yeah, so the, the character understands that as it is happening, he does not want this. But it takes him a little bit longer to realize what words are appropriate for describing the extremely not okay thing that happened. Um. Uh, but it's still yeah. it's still couched in language that I think still makes it enough. I don't think it's an outright yes for that reason. Yeah, but I think it's still enough. I think enough. I will caution that it is severe. Um, as yes, we said absolutely. earlier, for the gratuity, and so where that what that calculus is for any individual reader, like that's why these are two separate ratings. Um, for us. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I, I do think there's enough care about this. Yeah. Um, also, you know, that the consensual scene is really long for those who would like that. Um, and the not okay scene is it's like two as paragraphs. Short, <laughs> it's as short it's as so possible short. while while still conveying what happened. So yeah, I think to me that speaks a lot to care because it also means that for the characters, there's like healing and aftercare associated with it and just all these things. Literally the whole book is just aftercare. For this thing. Yeah. Then the moral directionality, clear, muddy or tangled. I think pretty Um, clear. Yeah, this is, this is pretty clear. Um, I mean, we have kind of two opposing sets of morals, but one of them is the better way to treat people, and the other one is just in portrayed as bad. Um, yeah. But also, um, one thing I will say is that it is not a situation of a good country, bad country. No, there's no, no, enough. No. There's enough that's complicated, but even then, it's like. This country has some good and some bad, but which is the good and bad are pretty unambiguous. Um, and then the other country has like a different mix. Um, but yeah, so I think overall cleared clear. I could see how someone might think it was tangled, but I do agree that generally it's clear. Yeah. All right. Well, and I think that also when we have the other country that is doing something that's not so great, 
the text and the characters call them out so emphatically that it's not an instance of one is like you're saying one is the good and most bad country it's just that the things that they do that are not okay are different Mm -hmm. um but you know the treatment of the other human beings that is not okay is called out pretty explicitly in character and through context yeah so definitely all right point of view for trauma and aftermath um so we're alternating between the two main characters um and so but we don't get markle's perspective specifically and he's the one where social isolation is more of a thing so we don't have the perspective of the character who's socially isolated we do have the perspective of the character who experiences the intimate partner violence um Uh, yeah and then the aftermath is him and his new partner we get each of those perspectives um new partner was not violent partner this is the wrap-up people might not have read the book i would like to make that clear (laughs) i had said that um in our first topic i think um I'd said that earlier, but like the the violence is not between the two main characters. I want to make that super spe- super clear. Um, all right. For the trope spotter, uh, this is abuse mistake. In this particular case, it is not played for laughs. This trope can be either that, um. It's someone, either it's either that there either is someone an innocent an innocent mark that is taken as abuse and then it's kind of a joke, or it's very seriously, um, you have clear signs of abuse that someone else writes off as something more innocent, right? Which and is the so one in this, this case, <laughs> right? In this case, we have um, an assault that witnesses don't realize is an assault when they see it. So, and that's uh, abuse mistake as a trope. All right. Uh, I try to keep um, sad things out of the tropes, but we really, it was hard to find one. It's also hard to find one here that we hadn't done very relatively recently. Like we did arranged, we thought Robin suggested arranged marriage. We did an arranged marriage, like not too many books ago. Yeah, we did that. Try not to repeat. Look, sorry. I just really like that as a trope. Oh no, that's totally fair. (laughs) Yeah. Um, all right. Favorite non-traumatic thing about the book? What What was your favorite? What was it? I genuinely like well done. Clues are there, but they're not screaming, this is a clue. Um, books that lay groundwork so that you can figure out the thing the characters are trying to figure out too. Or at the very best, you're asking the questions that they are asking as well. And, they're ask- and it's good questions, not bad ones. Um, this is just kind of a really well done, like, what's going on? Figure it out thing. But also this is a fantasy setting with cultures that don't really exist. And yet there were still several points reading it where I was like, oh, no, that's the thing that doesn't add up in your fake world. And then a pa- less than a page later, the characters were like, hey, wait a minute. Um, so, yeah, I just really liked it. I thought that was really well set up. All right. Uh, and yours? My thing. I oh, The moment... Okay, it's just like this really small moment, but I, I really, really love uh, the bit where... Um, where Vellison yells, like, Sh- Markle, like, show the man you can whistle. <laughs> <laughs> I just... That's my favorite moment. That was moment. so good. It's so cool. Um, I don't want to like describe it more than that because I would like anyone who hasn't read the book yet to get to experience that yeah. without just already having heard about it. Um, it There's a lot I love in this book, but that's just like this tiny moment uh, that I, I really, really appreciate it. Yeah, that was very good. It's great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's definitely on top five things for me, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Um, All right. Uh, I think that's it for A Strange and Stubborn Endurance by Foz Meadows. Uh, I I just, I love this book so much. I'm in the middle of my third read of it. This already feels to me like a book that I'm going to reread 
fairly often. Um, I'm sorry, I'm collecting a tidy pile of uh, gay men arranged marriage books. <laughs> And this hilarious. is going this is this is going in in that that pile. Actually, um, I think both of the books we read today um I think I'm adding War Girls to my to own pile and this one the only oh, nice. thing that even makes me hesitate is that it's so relationshipy. Yeah. Um but like I still may add it to the pile and just mark out the pages that I'm skipping. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I mean, I've I've got a different, uh, I think um, there's a different arranged marriage book that I have snuck into our queue. And I don't know, maybe that won't be slightly more your speed to unambiguously enjoy. We'll see. <laughs> well, <laughs> well see. I, I unambiguous, I, I, un- it's unambiguous. I enjoyed this book. I just, there's like four you- pages in it that I just don't want to, I just don't want to read. That's fine. Yeah. Um. But yeah, so Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us, and we'll catch you on the next episode. All music used in this podcast was created by Nicole as Heartbeat Art Co. and is used with permission. Our transcriptionist is Heather. You can find her on Twitter at MamaDragon20 or on TikTok at MamaDragons underscore Den. We're proud members of the Certain Point of View network of podcasts. Check out all the Certain POV shows at www.certainpov.com. Please consider supporting us on Patreon at patreon.com slash books that burn. If you can't wait for the next episode and need even more book related content in your life, check out our book review blog reviews that burn subscribe to the fortnightly newsletter or follow us on the story graph you can contact us by email at books that burn at yahoo.com and find all our links contact info and social media on our card books that burn dot c-a-r-r-d dot c-o don't forget to subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts and remember some books burn you